Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to Servant of Christ Ministries. Hope and pray you're doing well today. Uh, today, we're going to be actually wrapping up uh, Matthew chapter 5. Today, we're going to be covering Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. Now, if you're brand new to the channel, or maybe you just popped in on this video, what we've been doing is walking through the entire Sermon on the Mount series. And today, of course, is the end of Matthew chapter 5. And the uh, Sermon on the Mount series uh, takes place in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Uh, so hopefully you guys have been enjoying the series thus far. If so, please leave a like uh, on the video uh, and leave a comment after the stream telling me what you liked about the video or what helped you. Um, last week, we talked a little bit about turning the other cheek. I think that was a very valuable lesson. Um, it was an honor to teach it. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, but behind the scenes when I'm formulating these studies, uh, I learn just as much as you guys. And so, you know, through prayer, through study, I try to make it as easy to understand as I possibly can. So for all of you out there who are enjoying the series, thank you so much. And it is a blessing for me as well. Um, so this week, we're going to be talking about loving your enemies and how to love people who hate you. And we're going to get into that. Um, one thing I want to make sure I say before we get right into the lesson and I say what's up to the live chat, um, I definitely want to thank all of my patron supporters and I want to thank those who are members of the channel who have supported in many different ways. Uh, many You'll notice in my live chat that many of my patrons are actually moderators and do a wonderful job. And so I'm grateful for all of your support. You, you guys share my videos. And so we're trying to reach more people. So if this is your first time here, sit by, listen to the Bible study, see if you... Uh, agree with the biblical statements and things like that, go on my channel, make sure it is biblical. I always tell people to do that. Uh, don't support a channel you don't know the background of. But for those who have been tuning in and listening to the messages and have seen that it matches up with scripture, do me a favor. The only way these videos uh, go out to more people is if you like it, you share it, you subscribe, and you leave comments. Um, and of course, you're consistent with watching the content. Okay. With that said, let's say hello to some of the people in the live chat who showed up today. Uh, shout out to uh, Blue Girl D. Glad I am early today. I'm glad you're here as well. So thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Shout out to Nate 2 D2. Gift of God has arrived. Yes, you have, brother. Thank you for being here. Uh, Richly redeemed. Blessings from fam from Detroit. You always shout out Detroit, and that's beautiful. Have a good brother who, uh, good brother who lives there. Uh, shout out to Apologists in Detroit. Um, he says, today's topic is a tough one. Uh, you are absolutely right about that. And we're going to get a little, little into detail about that. So I'm glad you are anticipating uh, the scriptures today. Okay, with that said, let me go ahead and get right into the content. So let's move on over to the classroom. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to read the passage as we usually do. We're going to read Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. Then we're going to go back and walk through the verses nice and slow. Okay, so today it states, well, today, as if it doesn't state it all the time, but <laughs> here we go. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48, it states, You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Okay, so we're going to walk through the chapter uh, so let's start at verse 43. It opens up with a pretty, uh, pretty interesting comment. Um, one you may not have noticed. And also, I do want you to pay attention to the context of the chapter and the passage. Uh, as you guys know, I'm heavy into exegeting passages, basically bringing out verses piece by piece. But what I don't want you to do is lose focus of what Jesus is doing through the entire Sermon on the Mount. Uh, through the entire Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is speaking to the children of Israel who are very, very knowledgeable about the law. In other words, they know it. They've heard it many times. Unfortunately, Sometimes they've heard it the wrong way and haven't read it the way they were supposed to. Uh, and when you do that, you end up putting things in Scripture that don't belong there. 
So this verse is interesting because he adds something to the verse or to the scripture that he's quoting, and it's supposed to open our minds to a couple of things. So in Matthew chapter 5, verses, verse 43, it states, You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. As I taught you guys last week, if you're using Bible Gateway, one of the things you want to pay attention to are these little annotations over here. Let me see if I can highlight the blue for you. These little annotations, they're very helpful because... It shows you where the Bible verses are located in Scripture, so you can actually go back and read the Old Testament passage, which I do recommend that you do. One thing I do also recommend is that when you are uh, clicking on these annotations, don't just read the one verse, read multiple verses, uh, so that way you can at least grasp uh, the, the context of the chapter and not just read something into it that's not there. But for the sake of brevity, we're going to go to the verse. Now, as you guys know, we're going to jump into, so the scripture he's quoting here is when he says, love your neighbor is, remember I tell you to click it, uh, Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18, which is the footnote that we're going to actually go to, because I want you guys to pay attention. Listen, the verse says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Let's go back and read it and see if that's exactly what it says. So the Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18 states, do not take revenge or bear grudge, bear a grudge against members of your community, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So based on the passage, I don't know. Did you guys, did you guys catch it? Did you see where he said to hate your enemy? Let's go back and read it again just to make sure that I'm not losing my mind, okay? Leviticus 19, 18 says, Do not take revenge or bear a grudge against members of your community, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. But wait a minute. In Matthew chapter 5, and verse 43, he says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So what's going on here? Did Jesus misquote the Bible? Or is there something a little more than meets the eye in this passage? Well, here's the thing. He quotes it. Very clearly, very clearly, he says, it says, it was said, love your neighbor. But then he adds his, and hate your enemy. What he's doing here is not much different from what he's been doing throughout the passages. Now, many people will see that the scripture might say something, you know, you have heard that it was said, but I say unto you. And some people take that, but I say unto you as a, as a way that Jesus is saying that he's speaking against the scripture that he's quoting. And that's not the case at all. Remember, who is teaching? Remember, he says, you have heard that it was said. Who is teaching the children of Israel? Well, the Pharisees, Sadducees, those who know the law. Unfortunately, uh, they sometimes add things to the text that aren't there. And this is one of those things. Remember, he said, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So if we get to Leviticus 19 and 18, he says, do not take revenge or bear a grudge against members of your community, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The question then becomes, who added the hate your enemy portion? Well, the Pharisees and Sadducees. What they do is very uh, similar to what Hebrew Israelites do. If you guys are unfamiliar, they are an identity cult who claim that only the children of Israel are going to be saved, those who are descended from um, the patrons of old. And what happens is they literalize Maybe that's a word I just made up, the passage. So, for example, if you read the passage, it says, do not take revenge or bear a grudge against members of your community, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So what happens is individuals will take this passage and says, well, as long as I love people from my community, then I'm doing and I'm being obedient to the Lord. Is Does Jesus teach that our enemies are to be hated. Well, I got a couple of scriptures for you guys that will debunk that entire position just to make sure we're reading in context, right? So let's go to Exodus, right? We're going to go to chapter 23, verses 4 and 5. This is what the Bible says about our enemies, right? It says, if you come across your enemy's stray ox or donkey, you must return it to him. So of course, one of the laws is an enemy. Notice he said your enemy's uh, thing, right? Because he's not saying a member of your community here. He said, if you come across your enemy's stray ox or donkey, you must keep it because he's your enemy. It's not what it says. It says you must return it to him. If you see the donkey of someone who hates you lying helpless under its load and you want to refrain from helping it, you must help with it. So here, so far, God is telling us to treat our enemies fairly, right? Well, let's go to Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 21. Uh, it states, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. So when we get to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 43, he says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor. That's right. 
That's exactly what the scripture states. What happens is the children of Israel, unfortunately, have taken this commandment and have, have isolated the, uh, this loving your neighbor only to their own people. And that's the problem here, right? Most people would say, well, you know, love your neighbor. And the children of Israel are probably thinking, well, yeah, I love all of my people. Unfortunately, they've heard it the wrong way. This is why hearing and reading are two totally different things. So let me get on my soapbox a little bit, because one of the things I want people to understand is I'm glad that you guys are sitting here listening to me teach the Bible. I try my very best to be as honorable as I can to Scripture, to try to keep it right in the passage and show you things that the Lord has revealed to me in Scripture. What I don't want you to do is just take my videos, listen to them, and just that's it. That's the only time you read the Scripture. I want you in your own time to go back, read the passages that we go through, ask questions. It's okay to even doubt some things. Some people feel that, you know, if I don't understand it or I don't believe something, you know, maybe I should. You have to dig into the scriptures. It takes time to learn. It takes time to read, you know, so you have to put forth that effort. We put forth effort into a whole bunch of things. I mean, you have colleges, individuals are putting effort into learning different things, biology, chemistry, literature, and all that takes time to learn. The scriptures are really no different. The only difference is that this is the most important thing that you could possibly read, right? And so because of that, I want you to take the time to read your Bible. Don't just listen to me. Don't just listen to a pastor, a teacher. I'm Now, I hope you don't hear me saying, don't listen to pastors and teachers. What I'm saying is they are not the final authority on scripture. Jesus is. Scripture is. So make sure you take your time uh, to do that. So back off my soapbox and let's get right into the Bible passage. Okay, so you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your... Oh, I'm sorry. Let, let's stop here. I want to make sure I cover everything here that I wanted to. So there was another thing. Remember I told you, but I say unto you, when he says, you have heard that it was said, but I say unto you, Remember, when he was quoting the Old Testament passages, when we were reading earlier in Matthew, when he was saying, like, don't commit adultery, you have heard that it was said, don't commit adultery. But I say unto you, you shouldn't look or lust after another person in your heart because you have already committed adultery in your heart. Right. So he talks about that. And what he's doing is he's not canceling out the law. What he's doing is expounding on it, teaching you the deeper meaning of it. Uh, the children of Israel uh, took certain things literal in this, but literal in the sense that it's hindering the fulfillment of the passage. Let me give you an example. When we read about uh, do not commit adultery, most people at that time thought as long as I don't have uh, passionate or sexual relations with this person who isn't my spouse, I'm good. But what Jesus does is says, don't even look at a woman to lust after her in your heart because you have already committed adultery with her. So what is he saying? Well, sin begins before the action, right? It's a thought. It's a thing. It's a thing of the heart, right? And so what you have to understand is when we get to these passages, when he says, love your neighbor, he, he kind of expounds on that piece, right? So let's go ahead and let's go to, I want to make sure I go to the parable of the Good Samaritan. And we're going to go to Luke uh, chapter uh, chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Let me make sure I bring it up for you guys. Um, and we're going to see what Jesus says about individuals who are your enemy, who are Gentiles, who are not of your people. Let's see what he does here. And I want you to pay attention and understand that he is speaking to someone specifically who is familiar with the law in this passage. So in Luke uh, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, it reads, Then an expert in the law stood up, to test him, saying, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So he says an expert in the law. This is a person who knows the law very intimately, right? And he, the reason he stood up was not to get understanding, was to test him. He's trying to see what Jesus is about. He's trying to, let's see what this man really knows about scripture, right? And trying to trip him up as well. So he says, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And that's the problem with most individuals back on the soapbox. <laughs> uh, a lot of the time when we're walking through scripture, we think, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life, right? A lot of the world's religions are a works-based system of salvation, right? It's about what must I do? What good work should I do to make sure that I make it into the kingdom of heaven? And this is no different. All right, back off the soapbox, back into the scripture. So what must I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 26, Jesus says, what is written in the law, right? He asked him the question. He says, he asked him, how do you read it? Verse 27, he answered, 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So notice, he reads the passage that we just read earlier in um, Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18, where he quotes, love your neighbor as yourself. What does Jesus say? Does he say he's wrong? Well, let's continue. Verse 28, you've answered correctly, he told him. Do this and you will live. So how does a person inherit the kingdom of God? To honor the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Do this and you will live. Verse 29 is where we all trip up and he tri and the, uh, the law, the, the expert in the law also tripped up. Verse 29, but wanting to justify himself or make himself as righteous or to bring himself to justification system sense, he asked, Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So now he asks for specifics. Well, you said to love my neighbor, and who is my neighbor? Now, why do you think he's asking this, right? Because he knows the law, right? Let's go to Leviticus 19, 18. Do not take revenge or bear a grudge against members of your community, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. If he knows that law, why is he asking who is his neighbor? His response, if he's being literal, is going to be, well, my people. But he's trying to trip up Jesus. So since he's trying to trip up Jesus, let's see how Jesus responds to this question. Verse 30, Jesus took up the question and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him, and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road. when he saw Now, a priest, he's not talking about some random priest of the Gentiles. He's talking about a priest, a priest of the children of Israel. A priest happened to be going down that road. Let's see how this priest responds to this man who's lying on the side of the road, half beaten, half dead. He passed by on the other side. So he crossed the street and just passed on by the other side. In the same way, a Levite, right? So now he's talking about those of the Levitical priesthood. A Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. So he ignored the half-beaten man as well. But a Samaritan, this is a person who was not of the children of Israel, on his journey came up to him. And when he saw the man, he had compassion. So we have these two individuals that pass by, a priest. Uh, let me see, make sure I get it right. So we have a priest and, of course, do, 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 and a Levite. We have a priest and Levite pass by him. A Gentile comes by, a Samaritan on his journey came up to him. And when he saw the man, he had compassion. So he showed love and compassion to this man. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, that's money in their, in their, um, at their time, gave them to the innkeeper, hotel man, uh, and said, take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers. Notice that Jesus doesn't refer to loving your neighbor as something that you feel, but rather that you do and perform, right? He says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Verse 37, the person who's listening says, well, the one who showed mercy to him, he said. Then Jesus told him, go and do the same. So what's happening in the passage? Jesus is expounding on what it means to love your neighbor. And what he does is he uses a Gentile to magnify the point that loving your neighbor is not just mere feelings or emotions, but rather actions that you show to the person who is in need. So when we talk about love your neighbor as yourself or love your enemies, which we'll get into as we continue through the passage, you'll find that it's not as easy as some people think it to be. It's not saying feel good about what you're doing. It's saying do something to show love. So, of course, so what do we get from this passage? What's the, what's the point? Um, let me bring up the passage again. All right. So he says, you have heard that, it, and we're only in verse one, people, <laughs> in verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. This is the thing that they're hearing from the Pharisees and Sadducees. Verse 44, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, why is this extremely uh, difficult. So as I said earlier, love is action, not feeling. 
He's not saying in this passage, but I tell you, feel good about your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Or in other words, uh, do something in a way that, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Anyway, it says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. So here, a couple of things I want you to pay attention to. One of the things that happened, uh, remember who he's talking, he's talking to the children of Israel under the occupation of the Romans. Right now, the Romans are their enemies. And the Jewish people understandably viewed Rome as their enemy, right? So a couple of things. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples of love. Number one, uh, feeding somebody. That takes action. You have to take from your resources to someone and give to someone who you know hates you, right? And then he says, um, uh, and pray for those who persecute you. Now, not only are these enemies just talking bad about you or hate you, now they're persecuting you. They're doing evil against you. And he says to pray for these individuals. Now, if I tell you to pray for somebody who hates your guts, somebody who you know is mistreating you, that's hard to do because you don't want to do it because there's something in between you and that person that is kind of causing an issue with you doing that. And that thing is called pride. You are taking it completely. Per Although there are personal attacks, don't get me wrong, people can personally attack you. One thing I do want you to pay attention to is that there's always this rift between you and doing the will of God. And it's usually your pride or you trying to kind of uh, protect yourself in some way. And so I think a lot of people tend to create this, this defensive wall sometimes and will get to the point where, well, I don't want to talk because I'm going to get hurt right? Well, you've already been persecuted. You've already been mistreated. And God is saying to pray for your enemies, right? So pray for your enemies, people. Pray for your enemies. Uh, let's go back to the passage. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why? Right? So now we're going to get into the why, because verse 45 opens that up. Um, oh, also, um, it just popped in my head. Uh, remember when I talked last week about turning the other cheek and how I said that the Roman soldiers would sometimes cause or make the children of Israel carry their their baggage or their luggage for a mile? And Jesus said, well, go with them, too. Right. So this is an example of loving your enemies, because that Roman that Roman soldier was an enemy to the children of Israel. And by you carrying the luggage an extra mile, you are actually loving your enemy. It doesn't mean while you're carrying it, you're happy right? You know this person is persecuting. They don't love you. They don't care about you. It's going to kind of stir up some emotions. But what Jesus is saying is move past those emotions. Think from a heavenly perspective. Don't think from an earthly perspective. Think about who you're really serving, which is the person, right? Because by doing that, you cause them to kind of consider. Not everybody will consider. Not everybody will be nice after you treat them nice if they're your enemy. But the goal here is to please God and to do his will. In verse 45, it actually highlights that point. So in verse 45, it says, so that you may be children of your father in heaven. Now, remember, I told you guys to pay attention to the annotations, right? Uh, right here, I'm going to highlight it for you. There's an annotation where it says, so that you may be, right? Let's click that annotation and see what kind of information we get. The footnote is, or you may become, or may show yourselves to be. So let's take this portion right here, because I believe this will highlight the context of what we're reading. All right. So we're going to replace it with may show yourselves to be so that you may show yourselves to be children of your father in heaven. Now, this is a perfect example of the scripture telling you to represent God accurately. Right. So now it's no longer about you. It's about your representation of God. So let's get on the soapbox again. I cannot express to you how much and how important it is that you represent God correctly as a Christian, right? Of course, he's speaking to the children of Israel here, but the same lesson applies. How you behave, what you watch, what you listen to, all of these things matter. How you dress, right? I'm not saying that everybody has to wear a t-shirt. What I am saying is everybody should be modest in their clothing, right? Shouldn't be too revealing, right? So my thing is everything that you do, how you behave, how you act, how you treat your enemies, is not a reflection of you, but is a reflection of God. And when you think in that perspective, now all of your behaviors begin to change because now you're representing the king, right? If you think about the Levitical priesthood, 
uh, some of the garments that they wore were not about representing them or the children of Israel. It was about representing God, about being holy. Remember, he chooses the children of Israel for a specific job, which they failed. And we don't want to fail, okay? Their job was to be representatives in the earth to represent God to the other nations so that the other nations would then leave their pagan gods and come and worship the one true God, Yahweh. Unfortunately, uh, the children of Israel would go into the other nations and start to worship their gods. This is why God was so strict about intermarriage. It wasn't about racism. He was saying, don't marry people of the other nations because what happens is your beliefs start to mingle. And when that starts to mingle, the purity or your holiness in God actually deteriorate. And because of that, you become unloyal to Yahweh. So here, I went into a whole <laughs> spiel there, but that let me get back off my soapbox, back into the scriptures. Okay, so verse 45, so that you may be children of your father in heaven. Now, here's something interesting he's about to do, and I, and, and I want you to pay attention to God's love, because now he's going to give you an example of God's character and how it should inform you on how you should behave. Verse 45, so that uh, you may be children of your Father in heaven, or that you may be representatives of your Father in heaven. And then he says, for he causes his Son, this is not talking about Jesus, it's talking about the actual Son, the plant, the, you know, the gaseous fireball in the sky. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So this is what is commonly known as common grace, right? But let me explain that terminology a little more. So he's saying that the sun rises on both the evil and the good and the rain falls, right? Those are things that produce crops, that feed people, right? You don't have to be a believer to get blessings from God in that sense, right? And the sun and the rain, that is something that happens. And he's, what he's showing you is that because God shows that kind of mercy and providing for what people need, whether they're believers or unbelievers, then that means you should be the same. In other words, you should represent God and love people the same way God loves people, whether they're believers or unbelievers. And that's extremely important. Now, here's the thing. There are many groups out there, Hebrew Israelites being one of them, who are very unbecoming to individuals who are not of their religion or not of their quote unquote people, right? And so we're already de demolishing the entire worldview that you have to be uh, a descendant from the children of Israel in order to be saved, right? Uh, you have different identity cults out there. Um, so what we understand from this passage is that because God is loving and graceful toward believers and unbelievers, and by giving you the example of sending rain on, on the, um, the righteous and the unrighteous and giving them sunlight that provides food, right, that causes food to grow, rain in the ground, gives us water to hydrate ourselves, there's food out there in the world and he provides, because he does that, you should do that as well. You should feed those who are hungry, whether they're your enemy or not. Why? Not because it makes you feel good, but because you are a representative of God and of Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, let me make sure I said everything I needed to say on that. Yes, okay. So let's move on to verse 46. Uh, and hey, listen, if you are enjoying this content, do me a favor, hit the like button, share this message, help people understand the scriptures by sharing Bible studies with them. And um, if you have any questions uh, as we're going through this, do me a favor, start putting them in the live chat right now. And if those who are watching this on the replay, put it in the comments section. Uh, for the live chat, I'll be able to answer your questions toward the end of today's lesson. But for those on the replay, I may take some of your questions and turn videos and turn them into videos answering those questions, okay? All right, so verse 46. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same. So now uh, Matthew, who is a tax collector, throws this little portion in here about tax collectors. Now, were tax collectors well-renowned people who everybody loved? Absolutely not. Uh, they were hated. They were despised. Uh, many tax collectors uh, were considered as enemies and traitors. Now, uh, quick little, because you guys know I love film and movies, there's this film out there, I don't know if you've seen it, it's called The Covenant, and it, the actor Jake Gyllenhaal plays in it. Just to give you a synopsis of the film, he needs a translator, um, and it's, it's talking a little bit about um, uh, the Taliban and how he needed a translator to help him interpret the language in order to find weapons of mass destruction. That's it. Okay, I don't want to give too much of the movie away. But in the movie called The Covenant, the translator is loyal to him 
and protects him and is there for him. And uh, he has to show love to Jake Gyllenhaal. And why I love that is because the Israeli translator was viewed as a enemy, as a traitor, as somebody who is somebody to be to uh, to be hated or somebody who was viewed as wicked simply because he was um, talking about uh, just because he was helping the United States uh, Army. Now, that is very fam uh, similar to how uh, tax collectors were viewed at that time. Uh, so basically what's happening is here, uh, bec because they're under Rome, the children of Israel are under Roman occupation. And so what do, what do the Romans do? They impose a tax on the children of Israel in order to uh, pay for uh, the Romans being there for, uh, you know, whatever the Romans need. But what happens is many of the tax collectors at that time would also take uh, more money than they were supposed to. So let's just say you were supposed to collect uh, 10 percent from every Hebrew family. Right. Uh, and so some of the tax collectors would charge 11 percent. They would get the 10 percent for the Romans, but they'll pocket another percent for themselves. And because of that, they were viewed as traitors and as enemies against. So now he says in verse 46, for if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? So basically, it's easy to love somebody and to care for somebody who cares for you. It's not even difficult. He says, don't even these people who you hate do the exact same thing. And of course, again, let me mention, this is Matthew writing it. Matthew was a tax collector. And then he goes into verse 47. And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Now, let me stop right here. In verse 47, notice that he says, and if you greet only your brothers and sisters. Let's go back to Leviticus 19, 18 really quickly, just so I can highlight something. In verse 18, it says, do not take revenge or bear grudge against members of your community, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord your God. And then he uses the same kind of language of your, he says, and if you greet only your brothers. So he's correcting them, right? It's not about being uh, of the children of Israel. It's about loving your neighbor and your neighbor being every human being on the planet, despite whether whether they're Gentiles or not. Uh, and he'll actually mention Gentiles at the end of this verse. He says, don't even the Gentiles do the same. Now, Gentiles were viewed as dogs. Now, you have two people groups. We have tax collectors who the children of Israel abhor, and then they hate Gentiles as well. So what's going on here? What he's comparing or what he's trying to do is cause the children of Israel to think a little bit differently about who your neighbor is. Remember, the Jewish people or the leaders and teachers at that time were saying, hey, you should love your enemy. I mean, you should love your neighbor who are the children of Israel, but hate your enemy. Jesus never said that. And we went through multiple Old Testament passages that made that very clear that Jesus says to love your enemy. What he's doing is he's highlighting the false teaching of uh, the Jewish leaders at the time. So in verse, when we get to um, verse 47, he says, and if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? He's, you're not doing anything more than what the Gentiles of the tax collectors are doing. So you're not as righteous as you think you are. You're, you're, you're pretty much as righteous as a Pharisee. I mean, you're pretty much as ri uh, righteous as a Gentile or a tax collector. So why, again, these individuals, these Gentiles and tax collectors were viewed as individuals who lacked integrity. They had poor morals. They had no loyalty. And Jesus is pretty much, com well, Matthew here, since he's writing the letter, is pretty much comparing them to these kinds of people. Now, why is he doing that? He's trying to prick the heart of the listeners because many listeners are, believe themselves to be more righteous than they ought to be. As a matter of fact, even us. Sometimes, well, I would say most of the time, if not all the time, we always think of our, ourselves as more righteous than we are. How do I know that? Because sometimes we'll look at other people and say, I can't believe that person is that wicked. I can't believe this person did this. Do you do that same thing to yourself? No, you don't. <laughs> okay. So one more verse. Okay. One more verse where, well, let me see. Yeah. One more verse. Verse 48. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. Now, let me let me give you guys a little bit of insight. There is no way on God's green earth that you're going to be as perfect as God. And that's the point of this verse. Now, he's not saying not to do good things. What he's, what he's saying here is you need to be perfect. Remember, how do I inherit eternal life? Let's go back to the passage in um, Luke. I just want to highlight this one portion. 
uh, at the beginning of the passage. All right, then, then an expert in the law stood up to test him, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? God says, love you, God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, remember, love is not feel good about your neighbor. It's to do action. In other words, to do things that are good for your neighbor to provide for them, right? And he says, you answer correctly, do this, and you will live. So when we get to this passage, he says, be perfect. Therefore, as your fa heavenly Father is perfect, he's actually referring to God's ultimate perfection here. And also, now, sometimes, I just want to make this very clear, sometimes in the passages, in the Bible, you'll read that people were blameless or upright or perfect. What it's talking about in certain passages is talking about he was just a man who reflected God well, right? He was a good reflection of God. He was an upright man. It does not mean moral perfection, right? I, I do want people to grasp that as well in Scripture. If somebody's called righteous or blameless, it's not saying that this person is perfect and does not sin. What it's saying is that he is a good representation or a good representative of God, which we are supposed to be. So take that, um, you know, that little bit of information into your heart as well. And again, so much of what Jesus does through the Sermon on the Mount is to create this mountain of laws and expound on all of these laws to show the children of Israel that they are not as righteous as they think they are. And actually, that they are worthy of death. Now, what does that do to a person when Jesus expounds on the law and goes deeper than they think the law is and shows them all their little sins? What does that do? It causes panic in the heart because now you're thinking to yourself, I, I, I'm not this righteous. All right, because he said you have to be more righteous than Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, these Pharisees and Sadducees were individuals who tried to keep that law as perfect as possible, and they still failed. So you have to be more righteous because these individuals who are teaching you, many of them are hypocrites. Many of them are misinterpreting scripture, and you have to be better than that. And the only thing better than that is God himself. So you have to be like God in order to make it into the kingdom of heaven or to inherit eternal life. Now, can a person achieve that? Absolutely not. A person cannot achieve that. So what is that supposed to cause you to do? Well, it's supposed to cause you to think and say, I need a savior. Bingo. That's the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount. So we finished chapter five. If you guys have any questions, this is a good time to place them in the live chat. Uh, so we finished chapter five. Yay. I wish I had an applause button or something. Uh, we still have two chapters to go. Um, if you have not been following us, if you look at a link in the description box where it says Sermon on the Mount playlist, click that button. You can go and catch up and walk through every single verse in Matthew chapter five so far. Uh, next week, God willing, I will be going through Matthew chapter 6 and walking through a good